I'm a child of the 80s. I was born at the beginning of the 70s, so I saw the rise of the arcades, the rise of home computers. I was just at the right time to see the golden age of video games. That era in the 70s when Atari was just on the rise and then the, the coming of the personal computers in the home and everything. I was there to see all of it. I even saw the crash. I remember going to KB Toys and seeing just bins just full of cartridges in these boxes that didn't even have pictures of the games on the back barely even had descriptions of what the games were it just basically had a little drawing on the front of what the game might be and a name and like what controllers and stuff it used and that's basically it most of those were for atari 2600 so i lived through that time the beginning of the industry beginning of the golden age and its collapse and we're going through it again. The whole thing of people saying all over social media saying, oh, the second video game crash is coming. It's gonna come. The second video game crash is coming. Oh, uh, guess what, Sunshine? It's already here. It's been here for a while now. But it's not the same kind of crash that we had back in 83. Now, the crash back in 83, it's not caused entirely by E.T., not entirely by that. E.T. was a contributor to it. A lot of it was Atari's attitude, Atari's over-expenditures. Uh, unlike Nintendo, later on, Atari did not have a license requirement, a license and QA requirement for releasing games for the 2600. Well, where Nintendo, you had to have a license and you had to go through some kind of QA approval in order to release a game for the NES, which incidentally did not stop a turd burger like, um, what was that, um, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde from getting released? It still didn't stop that turd burger from getting in the market, but Atari had no such protections. So anybody could make a game. Someone in their basement with a computer, you know, if they knew how to code for 6502 and the chips, which were all off the shelf components that you could learn how to program for pretty easily if you knew where to find the, the, the books and manuals and stuff and how to learn to program for this stuff was relatively easy for people who were good at programming and it was all in assembler and people knew how to program in assembler for the 6502 fairly well back then it was a common chip so it was easy relatively easy to get into making games for this console and i believe they that you had to you could buy the 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 cartridge PCBs from Atari or you could you know source your own and you had to have you had to go through the expense of having injection moldings done for the, the plastic cartridges everybody did their own I mean Atari had their type Activision had their kind um in Magic had their style um Mattel uh, Mattel Electronics had their style. They, they, what they'd used is they used the Intellivision cartridge with an adapter on it. And they just had the PCB for an Atari 2600 game inside the cartridge and, and boom, there you go. It's a 2600 version of a, an Intellivision game. But I'm saying this, anybody could make games for the, for that console back then. And that was the problem. Anybody could make games. And a, a lot of companies popped up that, that took advantage of the fact that it was such a popular thing. Games was such a popular thing. And so they just started popping out garbage. Stuff that just you could barely play. There was no QA. Uh, Atari 
had no approval process like Nintendo did. It was just it was just the wild west of whatever was made. Whatever got produced. It was really good stuff. And then it was really awful stuff. And the thing is, there was a lot of people focused on the really awful stuff, especially the the bean counters and the um the financial people. Now, when the crash happened, it was a combination of several things. One, uh, Atari was just spending money like crazy. Their whole sword quest thing, they were spending an enormous amount of money on that. Just, just tremendous amount of money. The, the, the awards for sword quest were made out of real gold and real gems. Uh, there's, um, some story that Nolan Bushnell still has one of the un um one of one of the awards that had not been handed out yet because the company crashed before they could give out the award he has it still in his home or some some exec or whatever has has it in its home and it was never never awarded to anybody because they never got a chance to release the game until just recently when they finally you know when they someone had with in a the new atari finally released the last of the sword quest games of course no one will ever win that award but um atari was just spending way too much money there was too much crap uh, in the market, just a flood of games, and then a high-profile failure like E.T. happened. And the crash itself wasn't overnight, it was slowly over time. It wasn't just something that just, boom, suddenly happened. And then suddenly nobody was playing video games anymore. And it, and it really never was that either. People were still playing video games after the crash. People still wanted the games. There was still demand out there. The thing is, the retailers were listening to the screaming memes in the financial world saying, oh, video games are not the thing anymore. Don't invest in video games, blah, blah, blah. They were listening to them and they weren't selling games anymore. At least most of them weren't. And that's why we had the video game crash retailers lost confidence in it but the consumers still wanted the games that's why the 2600 despite the crash still lived on until the 90s yes they were still making and selling the 2600 up until the 90s and also atari had their atari 400 and 800 computers and they had a revision the the 400 and 800 XLs, and and then later they had their other 16-bit uh, computers to try and compete with Amiga and Apple at the time. So, and the Commodore 64 had come out, and that was doing really well. In fact, that primarily was used for playing video games on on tape and and disc and that came out after the crash and that was one of the highest selling computers in the 80s it's in the guinness book of world records very few things have actually beaten how well the 2600 sold so there was still demand out there it's just the retailers lost confidence and they listened to the screaming memes that told them that uh, there was no interest in video games anymore out there, or it it was just not financially feasible to invest in games anymore. Even arcades were still doing somewhat better, but they all eventually started to collapse over time. There were a lot of other factors there. There was some economic problems during the 80s there was a stock market crash i mean we just recently had one here uh here we're having one happening right now as i'm recording this um that was pretty bad in the 80s so we fast forward 
few decades, if we get past the whole return of the video game market, which it didn't really return, it's always been there, it's just that it grew back up and has gone past what it was back in the heyday, back in the glory days of the er of the late 70s and early 80s. And now we're experiencing another crash. And this one is different and it's slow like the last one. The last one didn't happen immediately overnight and this one's not happening immediately overnight either. It's manifesting itself as layoffs in a lot of big uh, gaming industries. And if you notice, if you really, really pay close attention, which are the companies that are suffering the worst during this time? Which are the companies that are seeing the most layoffs? Which are the companies that are experiencing the most failures this time? It is big, corporate, old, the old guard AAA game studios that have embraced and doubled down on DEI bullshit. It's them. It is EA, Ubisoft, Bungie. They have fully embraced this nutball insanity ideology. It has infested their games and people are sick of it and they're not buying. And they're sick of having, you know, woke developers screaming at them saying, it's all your fault, it's all your fault, you're the problem, blah, 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 blah. Or um, other devs saying, oh, I can't wait for white people to get out of this hobby. And, well, I think one one of them said that about D&D, but there have been some who have said that about, um, about video games and the whole thing with SBI getting into games and com completely destroying them, like Star Wars Outlaws is one of them. A high-profile game. By right, a Star Wars game should be an instant win, especially, you know, one that was touted as being so ambitious as Outlaws was, and look at it. It's a mess. I'm really not surprised at just how much of a mess it's in. I mean, they, the app voice actress that they're using, she's beautiful, but they uglified her for modern audiences, which don't really exist. There's no such thing as the modern audience. It is just, it, it's fake. And if you're buying, if you're a big company and you're buying into this crap, you're going to fail. You're going to fail. Buying into this whole modern audiences thing is a guarantee, 100%, that your business is going to fail. Get out of it. If you're, if you're a game studio, you're, you're, you're a smaller game studio, and your marketing people have been talking about, oh, we need to cater to those modern audience. We need to cater to them. We're we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna have trouble if we don't cater to these people. Fire them. Fire every single one of them. If they are pushing the whole modern audience thing, get rid of them out of your company. Anyone who is trying to push you to do these things, to push you to put DEI and all this stuff into your games, fire them now. If you do not you are doomed. You might as well shut the doors and lay off everybody because you are not going to make money. You are going to fail. And that is what this crash is going to show. The smaller indie studios, the studios like Hello Games, um, the more the independent studios, Hello Games, there's a, they're a small team. Uh, bigger independent companies like CIG, they're going to survive this. The makers of Power World, they're going to ride this through. All the really good indie studios that are making some really outstanding stuff right now and are just thumbing their nose at the whole modern audience thing. 
and are just focusing on really good games that people want to play and not being preachy and not blaming gamers for their problems they're gonna do well and if you have people in your studio your game in your game student you have people in your studio that are you know, saying gamers are the problem or if you're in a company that hates gamers and you work for that company get out because that company is not going to last that company's not going to survive when this crash is over those studios that have doubled down on that bullshit are doomed they will not be there after this crash is done which means we may see ea disappear we may very likely see ubisoft disappear we're probably going to see very soon bungie disappear there is no such thing as a game studio that is too big to fail these are going to fail they're going to die it is going to happen and it's beginning now and it's going to continue on for months and it and this this general stock market crash that we're having this is just the beginning of a phase it's 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 happening for similar reasons because of the same kind of policies but in general corporate world it's gonna destroy those companies it's gonna utterly destroy them and the companies that are not involved in that shit are going to flourish the ones that are actually making really good games that people actually want to play are going to flourish so you're just going to see more of this and you're going to see these woke companies double down and triple down and think that oh we if we cater more if we cater more we if we cater more to this it's going to work it's going to finally work it's not even even kevin feige over the mcu is saying um we tried this it failed, so they fired all their DEI people. Fired them all. Got rid of them. They still have to um, mend a lot of bridges. They burned a lot of bridges. And even I'm going to be skeptical of whether or not they actually learn from their mistake because they're doing this while Disney itself is still, you know, very much under the control of these people, these crazy people. You think they're going to allow them to, you know, get rid of the woke out of the MCU? I, I don't know. I mean, I've heard Wolverine and I've heard that Deadpool and Wolverine did really well, which Disney needs that because their parks are absolutely failing. So they need some wins. Maybe... Maybe they're allowing this to happen because they need the money. They desperately need it. I mean, how long can BlackRock keep them alive? How long can money from them keep them going? Even they're going to run out of money at some point. They, they can't keep propping Disney up forever. So, we're in the midst of a second video game crash, but it is not like the crash from before. For one, video games are not going anywhere. They're not gonna go away. People are not gonna stop making them. In fact, you're probably gonna see even more games being made, mostly by smaller studios. For one thing, the tools for being able to make games have gotten significantly better. You'll today than they were back then back then you had to have you know you to in order to learn the programming assembler you had to go to school to do this stuff there was no internet back then so you couldn't just go online and say okay uh let me look up uh, how do i program for a uh, a mod 6502 how do i program with this in assembler you couldn't 
do that back then. You actually had to go to some school to learn this or work for a company that developed stuff for the 6502 in order to learn the program for a, for a 6502. You had to do that. Today, nowadays with the internet, you want to learn how to program uh, something for PC, for x86, there are resources everywhere and the majority of them are free. Or if you want to learn how to work with the Unreal Engine, the majority of resources out there, especially for Unreal Engine 5, are all free. You can get a copy of the Unreal Engine and tinker with it for free. You can get the Godot Engine and tinker with it for free. If you have a decent enough PC, you know, just a, 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 a PC that's at least five years old or so, you can do this without a problem. If you have at least a, a relatively somewhat recent graphics card, you don't have a problem. A single... There are how many, how many games? How many games have come up recently that were made by one person? There's, there's been a few of those that have been made by a single guy, and they're not that bad. And then you have games that are mods for other games that have recently come out that are just absolutely trouncing the company that originally made the game that it's set on. There's Fallout London. This mod is absolutely incredible. It is making an absolute just mockery of Bethesda with how good it is. And it's a mod. So these so that this group of people from you know different walks of life from around the world got together and made this thing. And it is beating the pants off of anything that Bethesda had made. Like meanwhile, Bethesda dumped billions, or not billions, but you know, hundreds of millions into Starfield. And it's going nowhere. There are modders who have just given up on the game because it's just that bad. So, it's a crash, and people will call it a crash, but it's more a paradigm shift. You're seeing the death of the old school game studios, the old guard, these old lumbering dinosaurs that are slow to change, slow to adapt, afraid of innovation because they're they're afraid of hurting their profit margins and they are chasing trends, you know, trying to be the next Fortnite or the be the next PUBG or, or or be the next big thing in live service. They're chasing those pipe dreams. And they're embracing this whole DEI crap because they think that that's what everybody wants. They want to cater to these modern audiences, which aren't really there. That don't exist, and so they're not making money because they're catering to a they're catering to an audience that isn't real, and they're failing. Because the people who want the modern audience stuff don't buy games. They don't buy video games. And so they're just wasting hundreds of millions of dollars on games that no one's gonna buy. Except for a handful of people who are too stupid to know what it is they're buying. Meanwhile, the smaller studios that are steering clear of the craft and are just focusing on making really good games, not trying to be preachy, not trying to, you know, push an agenda. They just love making games. They're small groups, they're passionate, and they have tools that allow them to make games that are at or near AAA quality. So the tools are there now. And they can even leverage AI to help them make it even better. Because that's, that's the other thing 
that um, the people working for these bigger companies are afraid of is they're afraid of AI taking their jobs. No, they're not afraid of AI taking their jobs. They're a they're a they're afraid of AI making them irrelevant. It's but I, I I would say that's probably the same thing. But they're no, I would say it's more like they are afraid that AI is going to let these smaller studios do what big studios could have done. Where there's going to be a game. It's going to come soon. And it's going to come from a smaller studio. And it's going to blow everybody else out of the water. It could be Light No Fire. Or it could come from someone else that, that's completely new. And it's going to be made by hand with some AI assistance, with some AI tools. Guarantee you it's going to happen. And it's going to show, you know, the, these companies are not going to rely entirely on AI for making everything. They're just going to use AI as a tool, the way it's meant to be used. It's just a tool. It's That's all it is, is just a tool. And they're going to see, they're going to see, okay, we don't need, you know, development teams of a thousand people. We just need really good, talented people. They will use these tools, these AI based tools to create something. And then once it's made, then they will go in and tweak it by hand and make it better and make it something unique and put it in the game. That's how AI is going to be used not going to be used to make everything and then they're just going to take what AI made and just shove it into the game. No. The AI is just going to be one of the tools that the developers use and once they make something, they use that as the foundation to improve it. Make it better. Make it more unique. Put their own little signature on it. Their own twist, if you might say, onto it onto these assets and models and put them in the game. And that's how AI is going to be used. And that's what these people are terrified of. Because it means that these other studios are not going to need them as need as many people. They'd be able to pump out really good games with smaller staff. And because there's so many of them, they're not getting paid as much. Like, they're barely getting paid as much as a McDonald's worker. And a McDonald's worker can't make enough money in order to even eat at McDonald's. But a smaller studio making a lot of money will be able to pay their people a lot more because there's fewer employees, but those employees are better quality. And this is the paradigm shift. This is the change that's happening to the gaming industry. There are people who will fear monger and say, oh, this is the crash. This is the end of video games. No, it's not. Yeah, it would be called the second video game crash. And it may seem like it because they're going, Oh my god, EA and Ubisoft and them are all going away and crashing. Well, oh, EA, Ubisoft, Bungie, they are not the gaming industry. They're not the gaming industry. The gaming industry will live on without them. Oh, it may seem like they are all that there is, but there's more to the gaming industry than just them. Video games will live on without EA. Without, without EA, without Activision, without Ubisoft. If they weren't there, video games would still live on. If they're not going anywhere, People are not going to stop making games. People are not going to stop playing games. And you know what? 
the gaming industry is going to be better off without them. And we as gamers are going to be better off without them. Yeah, it may mean no more COD. It might mean no more Bungie. I mean, no more uh, Destiny 2. Destiny 2 might go away. Bungie. Um, Call of Duty might go away. Battlefield might go away. And those games might go away. So what? The industry will just chug along without them. Oh well. Oh well. Somebody else will just take their place. Somebody better. I've been Mike DeZorch. Thanks for watching. This whole thing's been a bit in unscripted. I know I rambled along. I'm 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 trying to do this a little bit better in this whole whole reboot of the channel. Um I've been working on some stuff behind the scenes. I've been I working on uh the new VR stuff that's gonna be coming up very soon. And um uh, I've been playing some Final Fantasy with uh, Tigra some more. But um, expect some interesting stuff in the channel coming forward. Just It's just taking a while and there's a lot of stuff to do here right now. Anyway, thanks for watching. If you like this video, put a give it me a like and consider subscribing to Zort Central. I'll see you next time.